Hello everyone, welcome back to Running Otaku. I am the Running Otaku and today is a special episode. I'm going to be doing a couple of different tests. The first thing I want to do is measure the heart rate accuracy of the Apple Watch 4 versus a common chest strap. In this case, it's the old Wahoo ticker, not the ticker X, but the ticker. So that's the first test. The second test I want to do is compare how heart rate monitoring, uh, how responsive it is versus using a power meter, in this case, the stride, uh, for keeping track of your intensities when doing an interval workout. Okay, so before delving into the tests and the results, I want to cover a few things first. Um, okay, so let's start with how do heart rate monitors work? Well, essentially there's two different kinds that are popular today for consumers. The first is, for instance, uh, on the Apple Watch, it's called optical heart rate monitors. And the way they work is on the back of the watch, there's a green LED and that light uh, shines onto your blood vessels uh, and that light gets refracted or reflected back into different wavelengths. And the, the optical sensor can actually see those wavelengths and record them and from that compute what your pulse is. The second kind of heart rate monitor uh, has been around actually since at least the 80s. Uh, it's a chest strap. I think the camera is too high, but it goes around like this, but onto your skin. And the way this works is a little bit different. It's got two pads on it. And these pads are actually electrical sensors. And what it does is it measures the electrical uh, activity of your heart. And from that, it can determine when the heart is beating and come up with your pulse. Okay, so that's how heart rate monitors work. The next topic I wanted to cover are some of the drawbacks of using uh, heart rate monitors when training. And you hear this a lot, that there's many different factors that can artificially inflate your heart rate, which kind of throws off the, the training zones. So I want to cover uh, 12 common causes that could actually elevate your heart rate and discuss those a little bit. So the first few actually have to do with medical conditions. For example, if you have thyroid disease, that can elevate the heart rate. Likewise, if you have anemia uh, and you have a kind of lack of oxygen in your blood, that will actually cause your heart to beat faster to deliver oxygen to your body. Uh, and third, there's a heart arrhythmia, right? This is a condition that could actually increase your pulse as well. Similar to that, uh, for the women out there, pregnancy. So if you're pregnant, that could actually uh, elevate your heart rate as well. So those are some of the kind of common medical conditions uh, that can affect heart rate. There's a lot of kind of daily life things that can affect heart rate as well. For example, emotional stress, right? If you're stressed out at work or you've got these deadlines, it can release norepinephrine into your system, which increases your heart rate. Likewise, uh, a cold or a fever, right? If you have an infection, your body's working harder to overcome that and that too will elevate your heart rate. If you have a lack of sleep, your body will naturally produce some adrenaline to keep you going and that adrenaline will raise your heart rate. Also the time of day, right? I, as I understand it, the longer you go in the day, the higher uh, your heart rate may climb. So if you're working out in the mornings most of the time, then one day you go in the afternoon, you could be a few beats per minute higher uh, during that afternoon training session. What else? Uh, drugs. So some are common, some are not. So for example, caffeine can raise your heart rate. Uh, if you're taking allergy medicine, uh, that can uh, increase your heart rate. Some uh, cold medicine can as well. Um, and then of course you've got things like uh, cocaine, crack. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you guys take. I, I actually, I think I smoked pot twice in my life. So I'm not really uh, want to talk about drugs, but some of them obviously can elevate your heart rate as well. So those are some external factors uh, that can affect it. And then finally, uh, let's talk about a few things. Heat and humidity. So your body has to work hard to, dis to kind of dissipate heat and, and you know, produce sweat, and that will increase your heart rate. Um, likewise, if you're dehydrated, uh, your heart rate will go up. If you are glycogen depletion, depleted, so if you've been running a lot and your blood sugar is low, that can raise your heart rate as well. So those last three, I think all contribute to what is called cardiac drift. Whereas you may notice when you're running, 
You could be running kind of at steady state for one hour, but your heart rate will gradually increase. And that's probably from a combination of increased heat, body heat, uh, dehydration, and that uh, glycogen uh, depletion. So I just gave you 12 different factors that can artificially inflate your heart rate. And these are, you hear over and over again from certain endurance athletes that sort of poo-poo heart rate training because those factors can lead to an elevated heart rate. And when you're trying to train in a very kind of narrow band for heart rate, uh, having it thrown off by five or six beats kind of throws the training off. And so I would say I agree with them, but I also disagree, right? On the surface, they're correct. All those factors can contribute to a higher heart rate and it throws off the, the training a little bit. But where I disagree is that being kind of thrown off is actually a good thing because um, you have to listen to your body, right? If for whatever reason on a particular day, your heart rate starts five beats per minute or so higher than normal, you need to take that into account. So if you're trying to run uh, an, a workout at a certain pace, for instance, and you notice your heart rate is a little bit high, maybe that's a, a, your body telling you that you need to slow down a little bit, that you're overstressing the system for that day. So I think there's a lot of benefit there. What I think really needs to be done is actually each day measure your resting heart rate to see what that baseline is for that day. And if you take that into account in your maximum heart rate, um, a lot of people call this heart rate reserve training. But anyways, if you take those two factors into account, I think there's a better way of kind of calibrating for any given day what training zone you should be in. The other factor many people will tell you, which is a problem for heart rate training, is heart rate lag, right? And what this simply is, is it just takes a while for your heart to catch up to your body. So if all of a sudden you quicken the pace or you hit a hill, it might take a certain amount of time. Well, it does take a certain amount of time for your heart to catch up. And a lot of people will tell you that it takes so long that it's just not worth it at that point because uh, you're just always running at a lag uh, and that lag can throw you off in your training. So there's nothing I can do about all of those factors that increase the heart rate, but I did want to take a closer look at how long that lag is when you change your intensity um, and specifically how well the Apple Watch 4 and the ticker pick up on those changes of heart rate. So to test how the Apple Watch 4 does versus the Wahoo ticker, I wore both on a recent workout, which was a pretty intense interval training session. Uh, so let's take a look at that and see what the results are. So this was the workout in terms of pace. Again, you can see the 20 minute warm up. Uh, there's some lag or, or some troughs right here because I actually stopped to take off my sweats, but kept my watch running. Anyways, the 18 by ones, three minute jog, the hill repeats, the striders, and the cool down. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look how the Wahoo ticker and the Apple Watch did for this workout. So again, the workout at the bottom, and here's the graph. So as we can see, in the first 20 minutes or so, the Wahoo ticker, which is in yellow, and the Apple Watch, which is in four, are highly synced, except for one little area here. Um, so it looks like they both did a great job, as best I can tell, of measuring my, my pulse at that time. Where the problem started occurring was right here at the start of my first hard interval at exactly 20 minutes. You can see the ticker, it looks like it's probably measuring accurately. It's got kind of plateaus and troughs uh, showing you know these uh, intervals here. But the Apple Watch started even from the very first one to go off a little bit. And then by the third or fourth one, it's just off completely. Now I know that Apple Watch is actually pretty accurate when it is measuring pulse, but something happened here. And I'm not sure what, but my best guess is that, <laughs> let me see, this pulls down here. My best guess is that the watch just slipped, right? I was doing hard intervals and must have been enough uh, force where the watch just slipped a little bit. And I tried to avoid that by making sure it's not resting on my wrist bone and, t and you know, fastening it tight to my wrist, but it, it slipped, at least I think I did. And I just lost it, uh, lost all data here really. And it didn't try to e even use my cadence 
uh, in uh, replace of the pulse because if it did, the cadence would have had these peaks and troughs uh, like my heart rate did for the intervals. So it just slipped. But at any reason, at any rate, at around 50 minutes, it picked it up again and was fine for a little bit, but then it starts doing this weird thing and not really representative of the peaks and troughs of those hard intervals I was doing. So again, it must have slipped. So I would say that the Apple Watch in general, I found anecdotally to be really, really accurate. But in times like these where I really wanted to, to see what my heart rate was doing, um, it just lost it because it slipped and that's a problem. So the next thing I wanted to do was see the ticker, uh, how it compared to the stride in terms of picking up, you know, the changes in my intensity during the workout. And so that's what this graph is. The ticker here in red, again, is showing that same thing on the last graph, uh, my pulse. And the stride here in black is actually measuring not my pulse, of course, but it's measuring my power. And you can see uh, just eyeballing that the plateaus and troughs for the 18 uh, intervals match pretty closely to what you see here in terms of heart rate and then the rest and then the, the hill repeats and the striders. So you can see just with the eyeball that there's a very high degree of correlation. But I want to take a little bit of a closer look to see exactly what was happening. So what I did was I isolated just on one interval. In this case, it was the sixth one that started at exactly 26 minutes into the run. Uh, and wanted to take a closer look to see how uh, the two devices did. Okay, so this is the zoom in of that one interval. And as you can see, the timeline is right here. This gray line, the interval start, was the start of that sixth interval at exactly 26 minutes. And it finished here at this second gray line, which is at exactly 27 minutes. And again, the black is the, uh, is the stride and the red is the ticker. So here's what happened. The stride picked up my kind of consistent maximum sustained power uh, eight seconds after I started the interval um, and stayed pretty consistent there. Now, in reality, I didn't go from a jog to my full sustainable power in eight seconds. It probably took me three or four seconds to ramp up. So that means that the lag wasn't eight seconds. It was probably only four or five seconds. Um, also, when I use the stride, I use three seconds smoothing where it gives me my average power over the preceding three seconds uh, because I don't want it to have too much variation. I want a little bit of smoothing there. And that may or may not have impacted how it was recorded. But at any rate, it looks like there's only about a four or five second true lag between my change in power and when the stride picked it up. Compare that to tick the ticker here. So it's showing 26 seconds from when I started the interval to when I reached that kind of maximum sustained heart rate during the interval. And again here, I don't think there was a lag. Um, with the ticker, I think what it's doing is accurately portraying the physiological changes, you know, how my heart rate was slowly increasing over those first 26 seconds until it hit that kind of uh, steady state. Um, and this was really surprising to me because we all know and probably heard that there is significant lag in using heart rate for measuring changes in intensity. But in this test, I mean, only 26 seconds for the heart rate to respond, I thought was pretty amazing. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at once I finished the interval at exactly 27 minutes, what happened in the recovery phase. So the stride here again shows about a 10 second lag until my power subsided to this steady state level for the recovery. And again, probably took me four or five seconds to reach that slower speed. So the, the actual true lag was probably only four or five seconds at most. Um, and then the ticker took 22 seconds for my heart rate to drop back down to that kind of sustained level during the recovery. Um, so even quicker than picking up the changes uh, going up. So again, really surprising. I was expecting way more than a minute uh, of lag. And it turns out the heart can, can measure changes in just as little as here, 22 seconds. And so those are the results. I mean, I was really surprised for a couple of things. One, I had a feeling that the Wahoo ticker would do well. I've used it on and off for many years and have found it to be quite responsive. The Apple Watch 4, this is the first time I ever did any kind of testing with it with regards to heart rate. Um, I have been using Apple Watch 4 for a long time and I don't really train with heart rate today, but I do look at the results kind of post run and I have seen more often than not that it seems to be pretty good at measuring my changes in intensity. Today, it, it blew it. 
Um, but that I think was because simply it just moved on the wrist a little bit. Um, so if you are much better at, uh, than I am at affixing it to your wrist and keeping it steady, I think you'll have no problems at all. Um, but if you're doing a really hard workout uh, and you have narrow wrists or they taper a lot and you've got a, a really accentuated arm swing, it could cause a problem like it did to me. The second thing that I found surprising was just how quickly the heart responded to a change in intensities. Now, I realized that this factor actually could be different amongst runners. For example, for runners that are in really, really great cardiovascular condition, much better than me, you might find that their recovery rates drop even more quickly and are more responsive than were mine. Um, or perhaps the, they climb slower to start with uh, and can handle higher intensities before the heart rate really starts climbing. So it's probably a little bit individualistic, but at any rate, only 20 seconds, 25 seconds or so lag between the significant change of intensity and the change that was accurately reflected in the heart rate monitor, I thought was pretty amazing. So those people who say that there is heart rate lag are correct, but it's only 20, 25 seconds. It's not that bad. So if you're just doing uh, one long uh, tempo run or a series of long intervals, maybe that 20 or 25 seconds doesn't make much of a difference. If you're doing really quick intervals that are maybe 15, 20 seconds in duration, then of course, yeah, I can see that as being a problem. And finally, I was impressed with how quickly the stride was able to account for change in intensity. As I showed you, I think there's probably only a three or four second lag. So it's not perfect, but three or four seconds, I think for most humans is uh, more than good enough. So if you aren't fortunate enough to do a interval workout and have a track nearby, you need to do it on the roads um, and it's short or you want to be really precise of when you start and stop. Uh, I think the stride is great for those circumstances. Okay, so that's about it. If you like what you saw, please click the like button. If you really like what you saw, then go ahead and click subscribe and that little bell right next to it. That will instantly notify you every time I upload a new video. And if you do that, you can follow me as I progress between now and April 15th on my journey to set a PR at age 48 and go sub three in the Boston Marathon. So thank you once again, and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.